Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's always a, a privilege to speak to SciStar. Um, so this talk, um, hopefully, I don't want it to be too formal or anything like that. So if anybody wants to stop and ask a question or uh, or to discuss any of the topics that come up, please do so. Um, otherwise, I'll just plow on if I don't hear anything from anybody. Um, so I've recycled a few of the introduction slides um, in this talk from a talk I gave to SciStar a couple of years ago. Um, so it's, a couple of them might look familiar if you've, if you've been to SciStar talks in the past, um, but the content largely should be different from that, from that talk. So let me see if I can just share my slides with you now. So hopefully you can see uh, a blue Queen Mary slide. Is that right? Yeah, we've got that up here. Yep. Right. OK, then. So let me start off just with the title slide then. So I've called the talk Was Einstein Right? So this is supposed to be a, a provocative uh, title for the talk. And I'm not going to come to a definitive answer to this. Rather, I'm going to try and talk you through what it would involve knowing whether Einstein was right or wrong. And then as good scientists, you can make your own judgment up at the end as to what the final answer to this question should be. Um, so through the talk, I'm going to try and introduce you to general relativity. So some of you may have read about general relativity, of course. Um, it's one of the kind of crowning jewels of theoretical physics. And there's a level level uh, six and level seven modules in the third and fourth years um, of the, the undergraduate degree at Queen Mary. So some of you may well have studied general relativity as well. So in that case, um, a little bit of the introduction might overlap with some of the, the information that you've got from your lectures. Um, of course, but I want to introduce everybody to the subject, so I'm going to have um, some introductory discussion about general relativity to begin with, what it is and how it works. And I'm going to talk through some of its predictions and how we can test those predictions with real experiments. And that's really what I'm going to mean by um, this question in the title, was Einstein right? Um, was his theory the one that, that best describes the universe and can we consider it to be correct? Okay, so my name's uh, Dr. Timothy Clifton. So I'm a senior lecturer in theoretical cosmology. And most of you probably know me from uh, my second year lectures in quantum mechanics A. And perhaps one or two of you might also come to my lectures in uh, the fourth year if you chose to study relativity and gravitation. So to begin with, let me just introduce myself a little bit more. Um, so you get a bit more insight to me rather than just as a lecturer of quantum mechanics. So this is my history of, of my career so far. So I started um, at the University of Cambridge, where I did my PhD. Um, so I did that under the supervision of John Barrow in um, the Gravitation and Relativity um, Research Group there. This one by, was run by Stephen Hawking at the time. And after I graduated my PhD, I went over to the other side of the world in uh, California to Stanford University, where I was a postdoc. Um, after spending some time there, I came back to the UK to take up a junior research fellowship at Jesus College in the University of Oxford. So I spent three years as a, a junior research fellow there before I went to uh, CERN, where I got a, a, a CERN fellowship to join their theoretical physics group. So CERN is largely a, an experimental facility um, and most of the people that work there are involved in the experiments, but they've also got a relatively large theoretical physics group, which in comparison to the experiment is quite small, but as a theoretical physics group itself is, is relatively large. So I spent um, a bit of time at CERN before returning to Oxford briefly and then coming to Queen Mary in 2012, where I took up uh, my current position. So that's my own personal trajectory. And returning to the subject of the talk. This is just a brief overview of the things we're going to cover. So I'm going to start off, as I said, explaining Einstein's general theory of relativity. We're talking about how we can test general relativity. And I'm going to talk about various different types of tests that we can do in different environments. So we can do tests of, of general relativity within the solar system. Uh, we can do extrasolar tests, meaning tests outside of the solar system. And in the last section here, I've got cosmological tests which is tests um, involving the, the behaviour of the universe and the largest scales that exist. OK, so let me begin then by introducing relativity. And I'm going to think of 
Einstein's theory of relativity is a theory of space and time or space time. Because really in relativity, we should think of those two things as being joined together as a single object. So I want to motivate to you why, first of all, we should think about space and time as one object called space time. So the first thing to understand in relativity is the principle of relativity itself. So this is of foundational importance to everything that happens um, in Einstein's theory, starting in, in 1905 with his special theory of relativity and is involved all the way through the general theory as well. So the idea here is we've got two astronauts, astronaut A in green, astronaut B in red, and these two astronauts are uh, moving with respect to one another and they're out in space somewhere. So we can't say they're moving with respect to the Earth. And what we want to be able to do is say whether astronaut A or B is stationary and the other one is moving. So you, if you astronaut B, you might well think that you're stationary compared to the experimental equipment you're using. And if astronaut A was to travel past you, you'd consider astronaut A to be in motion. However, if you were astronaut A, as long as you weren't accelerating, you'd also think that you were in a uh, a state of rest. And if you saw astronaut B at the same event pass by you, you would consider most naturally yourself at rest and astronaut B to be in motion. So the principle of relativity uh, that's built into all of Einstein's theories is that the law of physics are the same for every inertial observer, independent of their state of motion. And in fact, we can't tell the difference fundamentally between the two situations that I've got in the picture above. So there's no physical difference, according to Einstein, between uh, astronaut B being in, being stationary and A in motion, or astronaut B being in motion and astronaut A being stationary. Both physical situations are entirely identical, and each of these astronauts, if, as long as they're in an inertial state, uh, inertial frame of reference, meaning they're not accelerating, each of them should measure the same laws of physics. So this is an old concept. In fact, it goes long, long uh, back into the history of physics before Albert Einstein. And um, Galileo, in fact, developed um, uh, uh, a principle of relativity of this type um, that involved Newton's laws of motion. So the interesting thing that happens with Einstein at the beginning of the 20th century is that he goes further than Galileo. And he uses um, extra information that the speed of light is absolute. And that, that means it has the same speed as measured by every observer, independent of that observer's state of motion. So this, if we do a little thought experiment, we can see might lead to what you might naively consider to be a contradiction with the principle of relativity that I was discussing before. So let's do this thought experiment. So let's imagine now that I've got a train, which is this uh, rectangular block. And the train's in motion on the surface of the Earth. But as an observer inside the carriage, we don't consider the carriage to be uh, in a state of motion. And according to the principle of relativity, all the laws of physics that we um, do inside the train carriage should be independent of whether the train is in motion or not, as long as the train isn't accelerating. So in this experiment, I want to move to the centre of the carriage, where this red dot is at t equals zero. And I want to fire a beam of light in each direction along the, the length of the carriage. So at t equals one unit of time, so a small unit of time, presumably, because light moves very quickly. Um, after I've emitted a photon or a beam of light going forwards and backwards in the train, that beam of light's gonna have got partially to the end of the carriage. And then by t equals t, two units of time, it's gonna have got all the way to the ends of the edges of the carriage. And because the speed of light is independent of the direction that we shine it in, and because it's the same for every observer, if I'm in the middle of the carriage and I shine light in both directions, then the light hitting the front of the carriage should happen at the same time as the other beam of light hitting the back of the carriage. There should be simultaneous events. Okay, so that all seems pretty straightforward, I hope. But now let's imagine that instead of being an observer inside the carriage, we're on the side of the track, perhaps at a train station as the train goes past without stopping. Now at t equals zero, the observer who's outside of the train, sitting on the train platform, would still see the same event where the two beams of light are emitted in two different directions at t equals zero. Now from the observer who's stationary on the platform, 
they also measure the same speed of light for both beams of light going forward and backwards along the train. So now in this middle diagram on the right hand side, the trains moved a bit to the right because I'm sitting at the platform as the train moves past. But after one unit of time, both the forwards and the backwards directed beams of light are going to move the same direction. But now you can see I've got a different situation. The, the beam of light that's moving towards the back of the train has got closer to the back of the train because the train's moved. And the one that's going towards the front is further away from the front because the front has, has moved away. Now at t equals two units of time, um, the photon, the beam of light that was heading towards the back of the carriage has already hit the back of the carriage there, but the one that's traveling towards the front hasn't yet hit the front. So now for the observer who's watching from the side of the, the platform, I no longer have the, the beams of light hitting the back and the front of the train carriage at the same time. So this would appear naively to be um, a, a violation of the principle of relativity, because now I can tell whether I'm in motion or not by looking at whether the two beams of light hit the front and back of the carriage at the same time, or whether uh, the beam of light hits the back before it hits the front. Okay, so this, this would seem to be a contradiction. Physics would seem to be working differently for the two different observers, one in the carriage and one on the, the platform as the train goes by. So, uh, in fact, there is no contradiction here. And the reason there is no contradiction is because the simultaneity of these two events, the photons hitting the back of the train or the front of the train carriage, um, is a relative concept. So uh, Einstein took the principle of relativity very seriously and took the speed of light to be um, an absolute law of nature. And he got around this apparent contradiction by giving up on space and time as being universal concepts. So as you'll have learned from your uh, first year lectures, if you have two observers in a relative state of motion, then one will measure the other's clock that they're carrying to tick slower than their own. And if they're carrying a, a, a measuring stick, they'll measure the measuring stick to be uh, shorter in the direction of, of, of motion of the, of the observer. So Einstein changed what it means to have uh, intervals of space and time. He initially, it seems, what he's introduced is a an observer dependent notion of time and an observer dependent notion of space. And it's that that's responsible for this uh, concept of simultaneity breaking down. So on the surface of it, this looks like an extremely strange set of uh, situation to be in. So in order to understand how we can have a principle of relativity and an invariant speed of light for all observers, we have to give up on uniformity and a universal concept of time that no longer exists in Einstein's theory. He got rid of that in order to keep um, the, the invariance of the speed of light. We also find out that lengths are contracted. If we follow through the, the dynamics and the kinematics of what happens um, for particles in different frames of motion, we find that masses um, aren't independent of the state of motion either. And if we boost a particle, its mass appears to increase as we boost it to higher and higher velocities. Um, we find that velocities don't even add up, so that if I was seeing a train go past at 100 miles an hour and you ran down the train at 10 miles an hour, then the velocity of you inside the train compared to me outside of the train wouldn't be 110 miles an hour. Find out velocities don't add up linearly anymore. There's a more complicated law that we have to, to use. And we even find that energy and mass are related to each other by Einstein's famous formula. So this looks like a very strange and complicated situation at this point, because we have uh, we don't have a universal concept of, of time or length. So it looks like if you want to make sense of the universe, we have to do calculations for each independent observer. So in fact, things aren't quite that complicated. And the solution to trying to relieve this strangeness of every observer having their own concepts of time and space, simultaneity not existing, is to not treat space and time as separate objects anymore. So this insight, in fact, came from Hermann Minkowski, who was one of uh, Einstein's uh, teachers. And there's a famous quote here that I've copied um, from Minkowski, which says that henceforth space by itself and time by itself 
are doomed to fade away into mere shadows. And only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. So Minkowski here is acknowledging that Einstein's shown that there is no universal time and there is no universal concept of space. Those depend on the state of motion of an observer. Um, but if we put them together in a particularly cunning way, as Minkowski showed, then we can create a larger object, which is now called space-time, which does have a, a reality that's independent of the observers who are measuring things. So in Minkowski's space-time, uh, the concepts of space and time for any one individual observer are picked out by the motion of that observer through the space-time. So let me try and illustrate that a bit more with, uh, with this animation. So I've got an illustration of the kind of space-time that Minkowski was referring to here. And in this diagram, if you go up the diagram in the y direction, you increase uh, some concept of time. So time points upwards roughly. And if you go right, you increase it, the um, spatial position x. So I've, I've, uh, the, the directions y and z are suppressed here, so I can have a two dimensional picture. But the idea here is for any particular observer, so let's say the one that's following this dark green line going up the page, as they go forward in time, they would follow this line, assuming they stayed at the same position X, and we'd have three different events in the space time. So these might be um, fireworks going off or, or some such thing, something that happens at a specific place in a specific time. So in this diagram, uh, things are arranged so that light travels along diagonal lines and you might be able to see that there's a diagonal line going in the two diagonal directions across this plot separating black and grey regions. Um, uh, so, uh, can we ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, I even wondered this during my studies, but I think I forgot the answer. You know, CT, isn't that also distance? Because this is speed of light times time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, we've got CT here. So in fact, that the, the the distance along the y-axis is the same same as the distance along the x-axis. Yeah. So if you multiply t by the speed of light, you do have something that's got units of distance. So you could think of CT giving you distance in the time direction in space time. That's right. I thought that would be time. D didn't you say the y-axis is time? It is time multiplied by the speed of light. So, so the, oh, okay. the distances um, along the y-axis would be measured in units of, of spatial distance. So you can compare them to the x-axis directly then. Thank you. OK, no problem. So now if I play this animation, what's going to happen is that the white line here, which would be what this observer following the dark green line, what they consider to be happening at any instant of time. So this white line is going to move up the diagram and you can see that the three events A, B and C happen simultaneously for this observer. Now let's see what happens if we do um, a Lorentz boost and we consider instead of this observer, another observer who's in relative motion. Okay, so here we've transformed to an observer who's moving at 0.3 times the speed of light compared to the first one. And now the propagation of the rays of light, the diagonal lines haven't changed, and that's because they're the same for every observer. That's what um, Einstein um, put into his theory. So now this new observer is following the, the, the new dark green line, which is now no longer going directly up the page, but is slanted a little to the right. So they're, they're moving through this space time along a different trajectory to the first observer. And what Einstein's theory tells us, what the Lorentz transformations tell us, is that this new observer will now consider things that are happening at different time coordinates for them to be happening along this new slanted white line. OK, so for this new observer, all, all of the, the points along this white line will be considered to be happening at the same time, i.e. simultaneously. Now, when I press play again, this white line is going to go forwards in time, so we'll be considering different instances of time. And you can see that the three events that were simultaneous now become um, now, now occur at different times for this observer. So C happened first, then B, then A. And if we consider an observer who's moving in the other direction, 
at half the speed of light. Again, they have their new trajectory through space time. The white line is showing what this observer considers to be simultaneous. And now this white line goes first through A, then B, then C. So what were initially three simultaneous events change their order depending on the trajectory of the observer through space time. So according to Minkowski, this whole object of space and time put together into this surface is the thing that has its own independent reality. What we want observer considers to be time or space are the different directions that get picked out by their motion through space time. And for every observer, it could be that events that happen in space time have different orderings. So this is why we consider space time, because we don't want to have to consider physics to be um, over and over again for every possible observer we could have. We want to consider physics happening in, in one framework that applies for everybody. So we can have one space time that exists for the whole universe with different observers taking different trajectories through that space time. As Minkowski said, it's this union of the two that preserves the independent reality. So this is the geometric understanding of Einstein's theory of special relativity. And it was this idea of a space time that Einstein used to construct his general theory. So once he had understood um, space time, according to how Minkowski had, had taught us how to do it, Einstein started thinking about how forces work in a space time. So now let's consider two trajectories of two particles A and B that are moving through a space time. So the space time now is this blue surface, which is slanted backwards a bit. As they go forwards in time, particles A and B would move along trajectories through the space time as they go forward in time. And if they have no relative velocity and there's no external forces acting on them, then those two particles would be parallel lines in the space time. Now, if we add um, a force, into um, the situation between particles A and B. Let's say it could be um, an, uh, an uh, electric uh, attraction between the two. Perhaps we've got a proton and electron. So there's a force that might pull those two things together, these two objects together. And in that case, the trajectory of particle A and the trajectory of particle B will come together as they go forward in time. So what Einstein was um, concerned about when he was developing general relativity, or one of his concerns at least, was that Newton's theory of gravity seemed to propagate faster than the speed of light. It appeared to have forces that propagated instantaneously. And Einstein didn't like that because it wasn't compatible with his ideas um, from special relativity. So instead of having an external force that pulled two bodies together, Einstein postulated that there is no external force in the gravitational interaction. That instead of the two paths being pulled together in a flat space time, Instead, what we have when we have a gravitational force is that the two trajectories of these particles are following what would be the straightest line that they could in a curved space time. So as an illustration of that here, I've got um, a sphere instead of a flat space time. I've got something that's spherical. And you can see that particle A and particle B aren't being pulled by any external force within this new curved space time. They're following the, the closest thing they could to a straight line inside the space time. It just so happens that because the space time is curved, their two trajectories that are initially parallel end up touching each other at the north pole of this thing. So this is how Einstein wanted to try and understand gravity. Um, and it's a radical departure from anything that, that, that anybody ever thought about before, because instead of having force carrying particles or anything of that sort, external forces pulling things through space, he was now changing space and time themselves so that the particles um, could move closer together under the force of gravity. So in order for this to work, this new radical concept of, of what was causing um, particles to move together under the gravitational influence, Einstein had to have a way to describe the curvature of space-time, the space-time that was so important for his theory. So Einstein proposed a particular law between uh, the curvature of space-time and the matter that existed within the space-time. So um, this form of this equation was, was described quite neatly by John Wheeler, who's one of the famous American relativists. Uh, so he said that according to Einstein's theory, matter tells space-time how to curve and space-time tells matter how to move. 
So the idea in, in uh, with Einstein's equations is that the particles or the mass and momentum that exist within a space time dictate what the curvature of that space time is. And then once this curvature of the space time is known, you can work out what the trajectory of the particles within that space time is. So you have a kind of union of the two. And that's exactly what this equation in the box here is describing. This is Einstein's way of describing that relationship. So on the left, we've got this object G, which is uh, Einstein's tensor. So this object on the left describes the curvature of the space time. So on the previous slide, we have something that was flat, which would have a vanishing curvature. On the, on the right, I've got something that's constantly curved, a sphere with the same curvature everywhere. But in general, we could have more complicated curvatures. And that's described by Einstein through the left hand side of this equation G. We then got some constants of nature on the right hand side, which tell us that this curvature is proportional to this other object T, which is describing the energy and momentum content of matter. So the curvature is proportional to the energy and momentum content, which is what John Wheeler was describing that sentence above. So in fact, although this looks like a single equation, I can write down very neatly in a small space here. This is a set of 10 equations, in fact. So there's quite a lot of complexity goes into this. So you can think of this as being like a matrix of equations if you haven't come across these before. Okay. So it's a very neat concept that, uh, that Einstein develops here. So it's the, the general theory doesn't just tell us about how gravity behaves as a force, it tells us about space and time themselves. So it tells us about how space and time exist in the universe. And in fact, you can use Einstein's theory to describe the entire universe if you want to. So you've probably seen images like the one underneath here. Um, so the idea here is that the Earth is deforming the space around it. And the, the curvature in the, the space around the Earth is what causes, for example, the moon to orbit it rather than to fly off in a straight line. So it's, it's useful, I think, this image to picture how curvature might cause um, a, a non-straight trajectory, but this is actually a little bit misleading because the motion of the moon, what we attribute to gravity usually, is in fact um, the effect of curvature in the time directions rather than the space directions here. Uh, but this is a, a kind of a useful visual way of understanding curvature. So there's a lot of things that go into Einstein's theory. There's the notion of space and time itself, and the various different reasons why we might think that that's true. There's the way that particles move through space and time. And in particular, there's this relationship between the curvature of space and time, space time, and the energy momentum content of the universe. So in order to answer this question, was Einstein right? Well, we have to ask ourselves a whole series of questions, I think. Was he right about all of the different aspects of the, the uh, theory that he constructed? And there's a number of reasons that we might be a little bit skeptical about whether Einstein was exactly right in what he did. And it's easy to do this in hindsight, of course, because we've got uh, more than a century now of, of thinking about Einstein's theory and all of the physics that's come in between. So most of what I'm going to say wasn't known to Einstein at all. Um, but from today's perspective, there are a number of reasons why we might uh, be skeptical whether Einstein was correct. And the first and foremost has got to be that his general theory is not compatible with the quantum field theories that are developed um, in the, the early 20th century and, and since then. So in particular, um, the quantum field theory research program uh, successfully made quantum field theories of the other three fundamental forces in nature, the electromagnetic force and the weak and strong nuclear forces. But um, it's much more difficult and on the face of it, um, impossible, it looks like, to find a quantum field theory of Einstein's um, general theory of relativity. So in, in, in order to try and do that, you have to, to try and introduce a lot more uh, new types of physics. So for example, string theory or loop quantum gravity are the best attempts so far, but um, there's considerable extra complexity required to try and make quantum versions of Einstein's theory. So that's one reason why you might think that Einstein wasn't entirely correct. And lots of these quantum versions end up with um, low energy versions, so classical limits of, of them that don't look exactly like Einstein predicted. 
That's one reason to think he might not have been right. A second reason is that there appears to be dark energy in the universe. So this itself isn't necessarily a problem for Einstein's theory. You can accommodate um, this new concept of dark energy, which seems to be making the expansion of the universe accelerate. But if we do it with an Einstein's theory, we're led to some pretty severe fine tuning problems. And in particular, we have to tune the amount of dark energy in the universe to extraordinary levels in order for it to be compatible with what we see in the universe. So that doesn't necessarily mean Einstein was wrong, but it looks like Einstein's theory, once we know that dark energy should exist, requires an awful lot of fine tuning, if it is correct. Um, a third reason is that Einstein knew comparatively little about gravitational phenomenology at the beginning of the 20th century, because there had been comparatively few experiments in gravitational physics done. So when Einstein developed his theory, he didn't know about all of the um, experiments that could be done or, or what their results would be, of course. So he was working in the dark to a large extent. So in, in order to understand if Einstein was right, we should compare his theory to all of the uh, experiments that we can and have can do and have been done so far. And I'm going to talk you through those. And uh, a fourth reason, which has jumped up the list here for some reason, um, is that Einstein's theory of general relativity has some philosophical problems as well. And I don't want to go into these in too much detail, but one of them is that it uh, appears to violate Mach's principle. So uh, Mach's principle is that you should only be able to define inertia with respect to other particles. Einstein's theory goes some way in order to implementing this as a physical theory, but doesn't fully do it. So for example, you could have in Einstein's theory a, an entire universe that rotates. And according to Mark, uh, having a whole universe that rotates wouldn't make sense because you have to specify that it's rotating with respect to something else. And this was something that Einstein was concerned with, actually, and that led him to his theory in the first place, was these, uh, this, this philosophical principle by, by Ernst Mach. Okay. So for the rest of the talk, I don't, I don't want to go into all of the details of all of these. That would take far too long. Um, I want to take Einstein's theory at base, face value and evaluate it as what it was constructed to be, as a classical theory of gravity. So this is the kind of strict application of the scientific uh, method, in fact. So what we've got is a, a, a postulated theory by Einstein, and the scientific method says that we should try and falsify that theory by, um, by putting it to the experimental test and seeing what the experiments show us. So I want to do that with his uh, classical theory of gravity and see how it fares. So there's various different aspects of the classical theory that we can test, in fact. And what I've talked to you through very briefly in the construction of Einstein's theory it has various foundational assumptions that go into it. So in particular, there's a weak equivalence principle. This is that gravitational and inertial masses are equal. Or in other words, all particles follow the same types of trajectories through space time. Um, and that uh, it doesn't matter what the uh, what the mass of a particle is, if we were to drop um, two objects together, they accelerate together, together under gravity at this, the same rate. That's the weak equivalence principle. There's the slightly stronger version of this called the Einstein equivalence principle. And that says that not only um, do, do particles follow the same trajectories in space time, but if we were in um, a, a frame of reference that followed a freely falling particle, an inertial frame, then all of the non-gravitational laws of physics should be should be the same, independent of the motion of that particle. So this is adding to this notion of all particles falling at the same rate. Now the principle of, of relativity that all experiments, all non-gravitational experiments at least, um, in a freely falling frame should be the same, independent of, of how the frame is falling. And there's a third similar principle called the strong equivalence principle. So this gets even more uh, stringent. The strong equivalence principle assumes that the first two are valid and applies them also to massive self-gravitating objects. So instead of having just particles, if we have, say, a planet or a star or a moon orbiting something, and we assume that that follows the same trajectory that a single particle would. So there's good experimental evidence for 
these types of principles. The first one in particular was um, the principle that was probed by Yertverse in his um, famous experiments. So he showed that different particles fall at the same rate to within one part in 10 to the 9 for Yertverse, in fact, at the beginning of the 20th century. But the modern versions of that experiment give us an accuracy of one part in 10 to the 15. So we know that that principle is valid to extraordinary accuracy, in fact. The Einstein equivalence principle can be tested by things like the Michelson-Morley experiment, which is an interferometer that measures the propagation of the speed of light in different directions, or most stringently by what are called hugh Drever experiments. So these um, test whether the spectral lines um, of, of uh, photons that get emitted from, from atoms are the same, independent of different directions. And that tells us that the Einstein equivalence principle uh, has to be true to within one part in 10 to the 27 from those types of experiments, because there's no special uh, frames of reference that are found. So the third principle, the strong one, is something I'm going to come back to in a second, because we don't actually need the, the third one here in order to construct what are called metric theories of gravity. So the idea here um, is if the if we take the first two types of principles to be valid, and these imply that gravity has to be uh, has to be mediated by a single spin two field called a metric. So this is how we describe the, uh, the geometry of the space time that the particles are moving through. So this is the first type of test that you can perform of Einstein's theory, whether we need a space time, in fact. And because of the huge amount of accuracy in the Yertverse and Hugh Drever experiments and other similar ones, we find that um, we're really forced to be very, very close experimentally um, to space time being described by the types of geometry that Einstein and Minkowski had in mind. And these are called metric theories of gravity in the, in the literature. So once we perform these kind of foundational tests, then we could start testing um, what different types of metric theories of gravity we might have. So I, we've now, from these types of experiments, shown that Einstein, Einstein's assumption that, or Minkowski's assumption that space-time should exist is, is very accurate. Um, we can now, after we've decided that we need a space-time, we can test Einstein's equations themselves, which are the equations in this box here. So after these foundational tests, I now want to talk about tests of metric theories of gravity themselves. So these are now tests of how we relate the curvature of the space time that we've established to the content of that space time in terms of the mass and momentum of the particles in it. So if we want to perform tests of metric theories of gravity, then um, we want to consider the different ways that energy and momentum of particles are related to the curvature of space-time. And it's useful to be able to introduce a number of parameters in order to describe the different ways that energy and momentum could be related to curvature of space-time. <clears throat> so I've got four parameters here. So these are the four basic ones. There's a, a set of, of more complicated ones as well, but these are the ones I want to consider for this talk. So we've got alpha which parameterizes the strength of the gravitational interaction itself. So in fact, this is essentially Newton's constant. <clears throat> and Einstein's theory says that Newton's constant is the same at all points in space and all times. But in principle, it could be a function of, of cosmological time, for example, or might be different in the early universe. Uh, we've got a beta parameter. So beta parameterizes what's called the nonlinearity of the gravitational interaction. And by nonlinearity, what I mean here is that if we add together what would be the gravitational fields of two particles in Einstein's theory, they don't add up linearly. That is, one plus one doesn't equal two here. So we have to have a not amount of nonlinearity in the gravitational interaction. And Einstein's theory has a specific amount of nonlinearity inherent within it. But we could have different amounts and we can parameterize the amount of nonlinearity by the size of some parameter beta. The third parameter here, gamma, is something that, that parameterizes the amount of curvature of space that's caused by mass. So uh, 
in uh, in the Newtonian limit of Einstein's theory. It's curvature in the, the time direction that causes um, what looks like the Newtonian gravitational field, but we also get curvature of space, which has subtle but observable effects. And this gamma parameter parameterizes the amount of curvature in space that's caused by mass. And the final one here is, is Xi. I'm not sure why it doesn't go to delta, but instead it goes alpha, beta, gamma, Xi. And Xi here parameterizes preferred location effects. So that is whether gravity could work differently at different positions in space. <clears throat> so I want to talk you through um, very briefly what the current best constraints are on these different parameters and where they come from. So um, alpha is, as I was saying, essentially Newton's constant. And there's lots of experiments of, of determining what the value of Newton's constant is going back to the Cavendish experiment um, and so forth. So I'm not going to go into, into those for alpha, but I'll go into these relativistic ones, beta and gamma. So beta, which parameterizes the nonlinearity. Oh, sorry, I'm going to start with gamma, in fact. Gamma, which parameterizes the curvature of space, can be tested by looking at the uh, what's called gravitational lensing. So how the trajectories of rays of light are bent by the gravitational field of a massive object like the sun. So Einstein predicted in his, his uh, very first paper, in fact, in general relativity, that this should happen. And he worked out that um, for uh, the sun, if we were to look at a star that just grazes the edge of the sun, then the amount of, of lensing that's caused by the deflection caused by the gravitational field of the sun should be about 1.75 arc seconds. So an arc second is 1 60th of 1 60th of a degree. So it's quite a small amount but it's measurable. And this was really the first um, challenge to experimentalists from Einstein's theory, because it was taken up by Arthur Eddington, who uh, very soon after the publication of Einstein's theory, in fact, uh, went to the island of Principe and during a solar eclipse, managed to measure the displacement of the position of a star that was very close to the sun when, when the eclipse happened. <clears throat> so Eddington, under a huge, uh, hugely adverse conditions. The photographic plates he was using were apparently melting under the temperature, but he still managed to form an experiment that verified Einstein's prediction of gravitational lensing. His experiment had quite large error bars on it. Um, and the equivalent today is the observation <clears throat> of 541 radio sources, in fact, um, by a total of 87 um, very large baseline interferometer sites. So these are uh, telescopes that construct um, images of, of, of objects by using interferometry. And over 20 years and two and a half thousand days of observations, <clears throat> the modern version of this experiment tells us that we're close to Einstein's prediction to within one part in about uh, 10 to the 10 to the four here. So you can see the error bars are giving errors at the, the fourth decimal place. So if we translate that into the constraints that we can impose on the gamma parameter here. That tells us that the curvature of space has to be one plus or minus 10 to the minus four, approximately. And gamma equals one is what was predicted by Einstein's theory. So we're very close, in fact, to what Einstein predicted. The curvature of space should be given the mass of an object within it. Now, this was the first test that Einstein proposed. <clears throat> In fact, there are other observables, lots of other observables, in fact, that depend on the same parameter gamma. And I can think of um, the Cassini spacecraft that went to take pictures of, of uh, Saturn as giving constraints on exactly the same aspect of, of the physical theory. So um, the, the Cassini spacecraft, instead of measuring the gravitational lensing, that's the displacement of the position of stars, measured the time delay effect of passing a radio signal past the sun. So it took a long time for this effect to be calculated for some reason. It took about 50 years before um, Owen Shapiro managed to calculate that there should be a time delay when radio travels through a gravitational field. But <clears throat> it turns out that this tests exactly the same aspect of the theory as the gravitational lensing does. And the Cassini spacecraft that sent radio signals back to Earth in the summer of 2002 allows us to constrain exactly the same parameter to even higher, higher accuracy, so within one part of 10 to the 5 
So we get an even stronger constraint on deviations that are allowed from Einstein's theory. So this gamma parameter has to be very close within one part in 10 to the five of what Einstein predicted. The beta parameter can be constrained, for example, by the orbit of the planet Mercury around the, the sun. And in fact, it is known since the middle of the 19th century that there was an anomalous <clears throat> aspect to, to Mercury's orbit that meant it didn't stay as a, an ellipse, it, the ellipse processed around the sun. So that shouldn't happen in Newton's theory. And uh, I was observed to be this small procession that wasn't, couldn't be accounted for within Newton's theory. And Einstein's theory, in fact, does predict this. And it turns out this involves both the beta and the gamma parameters. But if we assume the gamma parameter is well constrained by the observations I just showed you, then this, <clears throat> these observations of Mercury and all of the ones since lead us to the constraints that the beta parameter, which tells us about the nonlinearity of Einstein's theory, should take the value that Einstein said, plus or minus one part in 10 to the three. So a reasonably accurate um, verification of, of the beta parameter. And in fact, you can do better by measuring the position of the moon, it turns out. So the Apollo 11 astronauts who landed on the moon in the 1960s left a retro reflector on the moon. So we can bounce a laser off the moon from the Earth and measure exactly where the moon is because they left this object on the surface of the moon. And this is the testing the strong equivalence principle that I mentioned before. So the other equivalence principles kind of test the foundations of Einstein's theory. The strong equivalence principle tests the field equations as well. Um, that's the G is proportional to T equation. And they tell us that this, the violations of the strong equivalence principle can't happen at larger than one part in 10 to the 13. Uh, so, so this is for measuring the orbit of the moon based on bouncing a laser off this retro reflector. And translating that into the parameters that I was describing before gives us a constraint on this nonlinearity parameter of one part in 10 to the four. So we're getting really some really good constraints on the form that Einstein's equations are allowed to take. So far, all of these experimental tests of Einstein's theory and the relationship between the curvature of space time and the matter content have been in the solar system. <clears throat> we can leave the solar system and start looking at more extreme systems further away. <clears throat> and in particular, we can look at binary pulsars. So these were first discovered in the 1970s, uh, the first one, and there's now several dozen of them known. And the, uh, what you have here is two neutron stars that emit beams of radiation and they orbit each other at very high velocities. So typically at hundreds of kilometers per second. So these are highly relativistic systems because the objects are moving so quickly. And by watching the beams of light that get emitted from these systems, we can test exactly the same kinds of gravitational physics. We can see what the lensing of the light is around its companion, what the time delays are, um, and so on and so on. And it's now getting to the stage where observations of these types of systems are competitive with the bounds that we can get from solar system experiments. And it's likely in the future that they're going to start beating solar system experiments for their accuracy. <clears throat> as well as uh, those types of tests, however, there's also an important other test that you can do with binary pulsars that you can't do in the solar system, and that's the emission of gravitational waves. So as these two bodies, these two neutron stars orbit each other, they emit radiation, which takes the form of ripples in space time or gravitational waves, as they're called. And that's what was awarded um, a Nobel Prize to Hulse and Taylor for the discovery of this, that you can measure the emission of gravitational waves by measuring the orbits of these systems. Even more recently, in the 21st century, and in the last uh, five, five or six years, we can now measure these gravitational waves directly when they get to Earth. And in particular, <clears throat> we can measure the gravitational waves that are emitted when black holes spiral in and eventually merge together. And what we've got on the right hand side here are real measurements of gravitational wave signals from two uh, gravitational wave detectors in the United States, so the LIGO detectors. This is in fact the first ever direct detection of gravitational radiation that was made in September 2015. So once again, these allow for the form of Einstein's equations to be tested 
And in this case, we can test even more because we can test what the gravitational field looks like in very strong curvature environments when we get very, very close to black holes. OK, so I'm getting pretty close to the end of my time, so let me just mention the research that I'm doing in this area before I wrap up. So my research groups are working on how to perform tests of gravity, not just in solar system or extrasolar, extrasolar um, systems but in cosmology, which is the universe as a whole. So we've constructed what the expansion of the universe should be, if it's going to be compatible with the types of construction that, that uh, people use to test gravity in the solar system, as I've been describing. And we get a set of what look like Friedman equations here, where we have the alpha and gamma parameters that take the form of Newton's constant and the uh, curvature of space occurring inside the Friedman equations. So if you've taken physical cosmology or a similar course, um, you might have seen the, the standard version of these. Here we've got where the parameters that I've been describing come into those equations. And the gravitational fields that exist in the universe on large scales also have these terms coming into them. So if you've taken advanced cosmology, you might have seen equations that look like this for Einstein's theory. Here we've got parameterized versions of these where the the amount of curvature of space caused by mass and, and the possible variation of Newton's constant occur within these equations and in these bases. So we're currently developing this idea to try and understand how we can perform tests of gravity in cosmology using upcoming observations of the cosmic microwave background, or oh, what these exist already actually, um, from the, the Planck surveyor, which measured the uh, small fluctuations in the early universe from the Euclid satellite, which is due to be launched uh, next summer, I think now, which is going to map out the positions of uh, galaxies up to a distance of 10 billion light years away. And the square kilometer array, which is currently under construction in, in South Africa, <clears throat> and is going to consist of, of thousands of uh, satellite dishes scattered over a large area of the southern part of the continent, in fact, of, of Africa, which is going to be the largest telescope ever constructed. So with these, these types of observations, we hope to be able to perform tests that are going to be the cosmological counterpart of the types of tests I was just describing to you in the solar system and in binary pulsars and black holes. And if you'd like to know more about gravitational physics, I'd recommend my very short introduction to gravity to you, which you can find um, in bookshops or online. And I, I hope if you have a look at that, you'll enjoy it. Otherwise, thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I recognised you nice just now. So I read that from the past. past. Oh, great. <laughs> um, right. right. So, so now, now we have, we have questions. questions. And, and I thought I'll start. I'll start. That's a bit of an echo. Um, um, my my question, question I'll start off with is, is a blunder for Einstein or what Einstein considered a blunder at the time with his reasoning was the cosmological constant. From a modern standpoint, would you, on balance, would you say it was a blunder or a fortunate accident and a positive thing? Um, okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so of course he 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 called it his uh, greatest mistake. I think didn't he? Was was the, the I think the wording he used. But the the, the way he introduced it, I suppose, was. Um, was was unfortunate because he, he was he was trying to construct a universe um, which wasn't going to expand. So, so when he constructed his theory initially, he wasn't thinking about the expansion of the universe at all, as far as I'm aware. But um, shortly afterwards, it was shown that the universe was expanding. And um, there's an, a Russian scientist called Alexander Friedman who, who predicted that it should expand, in fact, based on Einstein's theory. But Einstein didn't want that to happen. He, he didn't want the his theory to produce an expanding universe. So he tried to have a universe that wouldn't expand by introducing the cosmological constant. So that was an error, I suppose, because it turns out that, that the universe is expanding and and and, um, and you, you you know it was it was an error to try and to try and impose his idea of, of what the expansion of the universe should be on his theory. Um, but in, in fact he found one of the, the few ways that you can generalize his theory without messing it up. So in, in, in that attempt to try and construct a static universe, 
he introduced um, the cosmological constant, which is which is the only way, the only thing that you can do to his theory without introducing extra degrees of freedom, um, extra dynamical degrees of freedom. So it's really an amazing thing that he did, well, even, even though he's a little misguided in doing it. And it turns out that it looks like we do need, in fact, a cosmological constant just with a different sign to the one that he he wanted to introduce. So it's both a blunder and, and, uh, and an incredible piece of science at the same time, I think. Agreed. Uh, if anyone else has uh, any questions, please feel free to in the chat. Really yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, can I just say before you ask your yeah. question, uh, I'm just going to post a link for the careers workshop that Maya Menderatu is running at three o'clock. So if any of you wanted to rush off and do that, then uh, there is the link. You can do that. But just wanted to say that because she did ask me to advertise that. So there you go. Um, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was a nice lecture. I just wanted to ask because I've been I've always been wondering about this. Uh, what is the evidence for an expanding universe other than the using the Doppler effect? Because I, I was uh, I was very you know uh, surprised that we only use one type of evidence, or maybe we use more. Okay, it's, it's a good question. There's 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 actually lots of evidence um, these days for an expanding universe. Um, so the the gravitational redshift effect that you described is is certainly one of them. If you if you look at the motion of galaxies. <clears throat> Based on that effect, it appears that the net motion is away from us. And if you look at galaxies are further away, they appear to be moving away from us even faster. So um, a natural interpretation of that is an expanding universe, I think. Um, but the, the CMB that I mentioned is, is probably even stronger evidence. Because that shows that if you look far enough away, because when you look further away, you can't, you're looking backwards in time in a way. Um, if I look one light year away, I see something a year um, in the past, if you see what I mean, because it took a year from the, the light from that object to get to me. If I look back far enough, I can see the hot stages of the universe. So the CMB is actually showing us what the early universe looked like, what the universe looked like when it was um, 100,000 years old. So because we can see what that looks like and because it, it looks ex pretty much exactly like what we'd expect from, from a, 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 a universe um, that was expanding, because in the past, if it's expanding, it cools down. If you reverse that and make it contract into the past, it heats up. And if you reverse what um, the structures we have in the universe today, you end up with the small fluctuations you see in the CMB. Um, that, I think, was was the, 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 the most strong evidence for a, for a hot Big Bang and an expanding universe. And in fact, that, that was what killed the, uh, the steady state universe that Fred Hoyle um, wanted to, to happen as well. Thank you. OK. Um, we have had a uh, we have got a question in the uh, chat um, which says, uh, what was it like to work under the late professor John Barrow? That's a nice question. Thanks, Kamani. Um, so uh, John was great. So um, he's he was. An interesting character as well. I don't think I've ever worked with anyone before or since like like John. Um, so I suppose a lot, a lot of you have probably read his books. I suppose that's how most people um, know him. Um, so he, he wrote in particular a book on the anthropic um, principle, which is the principle that we, we observe the universe that is, that is required in order for us to exist. So there's, there's, there's quite a lot that you can get out of that kind of principle. And um, he, he liked thinking about fine tuning of constants and things, um, but it is, He's an incredible, lively character. So my supervisions with him used to entail him kind of running into my office um, with the latest idea he's had, fitting the whiteboard with, with thoughts and equations, and then running about again quickly to get to the next meeting he had to go to. But he's, uh, it was good. And um, it's, it's, it's a shame he died last year. He'll be missed. OK, then. Um... If anyone else has questions, just... Hello. Oh, okay, there you go. Uh, go thank you for the uh, talk. Uh, I have a small question. Um, we know that um, general relativity doesn't work at the center of black holes. Um, is there any anywhere else where it fails to work that we know of? Um, that's a very interesting question. 
Um, so so I, I suppose we, we don't we don't yet know that it doesn't work at the centre of black holes because you can't go inside a black hole. But what you, what you can say is that it's not compatible with quantum mechanics or quantum field theory more specifically when you get to the, the close to the singularity inside a black hole. Um, so there, there are other environments where you have the same kind of contradiction between general relativity and, and quantum field theory. So the, the very early universe might be one. <clears throat> in the same way they have a singularity inside a black hole, if you wind the universe back, you have a, a, a slightly different type of singularity, but nevertheless a singularity in the past as well in the universe. And you'd expect a similar kind of contradiction between quantum field theory and, and uh, general relativity when you get into that regime as well. As yet, there's there's no direct observations that um, Einstein was wrong in any aspect of his theory, in fact. Um, so it's hard to say that we, we know a regime where it goes wrong, because we, we've never been able to find any experimental evidence that he is wrong, in fact, um, despite having developed a lot of new types of tests that he never knew about. Um, but you can construct thought experiments in, in less extreme regimes as well. So there's one that Roger Penrose is keen on, um, where because of the non-linearity non of Einstein's equations that I was describing, if you try and think of the superposition principle that's required in quantum mechanics, and you try and work out the gravitational field of the superposition of, of lots of different potential positions of a particle, then in general relativity, you can't just add them up linearly. So you seem to break um, e even the, the the most straightforward interpretations of, of the gravitational fields of quantum mechanical objects in Einstein's theory. Um, but again, there's been no experimental evidence of that found, um, partly because gravitational fields are so weak. And in order to get quantum superpositions, we need small systems. Um, Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Uh, we, have another, we, have, we have another question in the chat. Uh, would the Einstein equations hold for white holes and worm or wormholes? Very good. Um, so that's a difficult one because um, neither of those things is quite probable that neither of those things exist in the real universe. So um, it's, it's hard to answer that definitively, I suppose. Um, if we came across a wormhole, then we could certainly do tests around that wormhole, the gravitational field of it, to see if, if it obeys what Einstein thought would happen. Um, but there's n there's no evidence that either of those things exist, and there's good reason to think that they might, they probably don't exist, in fact. Um, the, the interesting thing about them, I suppose, is that Einstein's theory allows for the possibility of those things to exist. And in fact, the, the Schwarzschild solution to Einstein's equations, which you might have come across if you've got space, time and gravity, has white holes and wormholes built into it already. Um, and I'll go, in, I'll go into some of the details of those in my lecture course in the fourth year. Um, but without having access to um, physical real versions of those things, it's hard to say whether Einstein's equations would, would properly describe them or not. What we can say is that we can, we can mathematically, um, we can find mathematically situations that describe those kinds of things within Einstein's theory. Um, so that's certainly true. Those things exist within the theory. But it's hard to say whether Einstein's equations would be true for real versions of those things because they probably don't exist. We certainly haven't found them. Uh, I have a question about the anthropic principle you mentioned. Yeah, so uh, this is also one of those interesting things I've been wondering about. Um, wouldn't the exit, like I feel like uh, the scientific community have disregarded this possibility, but wouldn't a multiverse possibly exacerbate the situation of the fine tuning problem as all of those you know, universes might also be? Uh, fine-tuned. Yeah, um, so, so this this actually um, goes back to the cosmological constant problem as well that I mentioned during the talk. So the, the, the problem with the cosmological constant, which I think is what you're referring to, is, is um, that it requires such an enormous degree of fine-tuning. So if, if you were to try and predict what its value might be from, from quantum field theories, then you'd predict a value that was 120 orders of magnitude too big. So, so just, just based on the simplest concepts that you could, you don't seem to be able to create the kind of cosmological constant that we require in the real universe. So one possible explanation of this is the anthropic principle, um, which is if, if the cosmological constant did take that value, the universe would expand so quickly that we could never exist in it. It would pull our atoms apart before, before any life could have, could have evolved, or any structures could have evolved anywhere. <clears throat> so the, the anthropic 
kind of answer to this is that we 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 can only live in a universe that has a cosmological constant that allows for us to develop as a species that can observe it. And that, that puts a, an upper bound on what the, the value of the cosmological constant can take, because if it goes above that bound, then planets and stars and life never form, so we couldn't observe it. So it's an, it's an interesting kind of argument that, that we couldn't possibly observe one that's too far outside of the bound that we do observe it. Um, but it's it's kind of, it's philosophically not so satisfactory, I think, for some people, in that it's not really a scientific explanation. It's more of a it's more of a tautology. It's something that has to be true in order for for us to be able to say it. <clears throat> um, but the the multiverse explanation that you mentioned as well. Um, again, that's a kind of a, a controversial issue because it's something that we, we fundamentally can't observe. So it's it's kind of outside of the scientific method in a way. So you might you might postulate it as a as a way of trying to understand the universe, <clears throat> but unless you can directly probe an idea, it's not really a scientific idea. Um, so, so at that level, it's it's kind of more metaphysics, I think, the idea of a multiverse, unless you can find a physical prediction of the multiverse having to exist. So if if a, a multiverse led to some specific signature in in the early universe or or some such thing, that then you could test that. But, uh, but um, there, there aren't. There's, there's one or two notions of, of things that might be caused by a multiverse, but there's there's no specific smoking gun kind of evidence that you could look for. I think, and as as such, it, it seems like it's more metaphysics than, than physics, to my mind at least. Although people disagree on that. Okay, we've got two more questions. Um, I'll go in order. Earlier, you mentioned quantum gravity and string theory as possible unifiers. Which do you think is getting closer to a more unified field theory? Uh, and is there further a possibility of, com or is there further a possibility of combining the two? And then the second question, just so that you get both, which modules would you recommend taking in fourth year for a student who's interested in pursuing higher research in theoretical cosmology? Okay. Um, so I'll start with the first one. Yes. <clears throat> so um, I suppose I, I'm not the person to, to probably try and answer that question as I'm not involved in, in research in string theory or loop quantum gravity. Um, in it, Queen Mary, this, in the SPA, you are quite lucky in that we've got a large number of people who really are involved in those, um, which is relatively unusual for, for a physics department to have a larger string theory group as the one that, that we have. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to stick my neck out on that one, but I'd recommend that you try and find somebody from um, the CRST group and ask that question to them to get their expert opinion on that one. And um, for the second question, so which modules? Um, so for, for theoretical cosmology, there's um, my own module on relativity and gravitation. So that's, as it sounds, um, more on the relativity side of things. Um, so there's, there's, we cover black holes in that um, and gravitational waves and similar such things. Uh, there's a module advanced cosmology that Kareem Malik gives, um, which is which is a, a very good one, I think. Um, certainly if you want to do theoretical cosmology. Um, the other ones that you might consider looking at, some of the ones <coughs> excuse me, from the theoretical physics MSC. So quantum field theory comes into um, early universe cosmology. So if you're interested in that, that side of cosmology, then some of the uh, modules from quantum field theory from the theoretical physics MSc might be of interest to you as well. OK, no problem. OK, so unless we receive any more uh, questions, uh, I'm just going to quickly uh, say thank you, uh, Dr. T Dr. Clifton. Um, it's been really, really fun. We've enjoyed listening. I hope you've enjoyed talking. Uh, so thank you. And uh, I would recommend people take his fourth year module because I know he was great in second year. Um, yep. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks everybody for listening. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Two shouts before people leave. Uh, uh, please vote in the elections. They close on Friday. Yeah. Uh, and for once, we have two candidates for all of the positions. And also, 
But next week we have a PhD seminar with Sebastian Lobbers on music, uh, music technology, Beltran Saxkova Gotha on his research at Imperial into weather physics, well, climate physics, sorry, and Joe Davies on his machine learning work at CERN. So you'll want to be there for that. Most people at our level don't know what a PhD is until they go to an event like this. Trust me. So mm -hmm. be there or be square. Anyway, thank you once again. Uh, we can also point out uh, that beyond that, um, for Ardy, who's interested in uh, unified field theories, that mm -hmm. Dr. Chris White, after the PhD event, uh, we, uh, will be doing a talk on the double copy theory, um, and uh, that will uh, hopefully have uh, more of a, a chance at answering. If you love a bit of theoretical physics, but put in a very straightforward way, the double copy theory is definitely for you. So, lovely. Uh, everyone have a good day and bye-bye. Yeah, thank you very much for coming.